Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Premi Chats. Premi Chats is our weekly educational session for healthcare professionals and parents to talk about what matters to you, to explore new ideas, and to learn together. I'm Fabiana Bakina. I'm a Premi Parent and Executive Director of the Canadian Premature Babies Foundation, as known as CPBF, and I'm happy to be your host today. CPBF is a parent-led charitable organization that helps families in and after the NICU through education, support, and advocacy. If you have a heart for preemies, whether you're a family or a healthcare professional, please check our website at canadianpremies.org. There you'll find resources, the latest projects, and most importantly, a community of people who wants to see our little babies thrive. If you're watching live today, please bring your voice to this table. Leave comments and questions in the chat and you'll try to address them during our program. It is through rich conversations like this where we can advance practice and learn together. So please participate and let us know where you're watching from. And today we're going to talk about how we can make the NICU a brighter place. This talk will explore how nurses can positively impact the parent experience in the NICU. And I have here joining us live from Montreal is Stephanie Trehern, who works as a bedside nurse in the new NATO intensive care unit at the Jewish General Hospital in Montreal. She completed her Master of Science in Nursing at McGill University in 2016. Her research project focused on parent closeness and separation from their infant in the NICU and was published in 2017. This experience allowed her to learn a lot about the NICU environment and discover her love for the NICU and the patients they care for. He also gave her insight into the parent experience and impact nurses and the impact nurses can have on them. She believes the project helps her to uh, helps her to place more value on small interventions she can do to help parents feel more at ease and comfortable in the NICU. So she is very crafted and she loves to acknowledge holidays, celebrate milestones and encourage parents. Stephanie, I'm so happy to have you here today because I absolutely love your work. I learned about you when we met at Epi Conference in February. And I said, okay, you got to do this chat and share with the world your creativity and the way you support families in the NICU. So thank you so much for being here today. Hi, Fabiana. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to share all of this with uh, everyone who wants to learn more about it. Wonderful. So I know we have a presentation of amazing, beautiful pictures. And for all of you watching us live today, please keep questions, send us comments, and you're going to address them at the end of her presentation. Thank you. Stephanie, the floor is yours. Okay, so hello everyone. Um, I'm going to share with you my thoughts on how we can make the NICU a bit of a brighter place today. Um, I realize most of this has been said now in the introduction, but I've been working in the NICU since June 2016 at the Jewish General Hospital in Montreal. Um, I've always loved arts and crafts, which will come in, you'll see a little bit later. And I completed my master's in nursing um, at McGill, focused on parent experience in the NICU. So first I'll start with a little bit about my project and you'll see why, um, why it kind of helped me become maybe a bit more in tune with the parent experience or more aware of it. Uh, so my project was called Parents' Perspectives of Closeness and Separation with their Preterm Infant in the NICU. Um, we wanted to learn a little bit more because we knew already that closeness uh, between a parent and their infant in the NICU would help decrease stress, anxiety, depression in the parents and could help stabilize uh, infant vital signs. And we knew also that NICU hospitalization caused anxiety, stress and alienation from the parent role. Um, and the, we have a lot of physical barriers within the NICU that could have a negative impact on the attachment process. However, we wanted to understand better um, from the parent's perspective how how they perceived the closeness and separation between them and their baby. So we spoke to 20 parents, both mothers and fathers, and they spoke about uh, moments of closeness and separation between them and their baby over a 24 hour period. And we were able to summarize them into a couple of different themes. So the first one was having a role as a parent, feeling autonomous and making decisions. And actually you'll see for all of the themes, the closeness and separation could kind of flip 
Uh, so each theme could have moments of separation, but also moments of uh, closeness. So in the first one, um, parents were feeling close when they were providing care for their baby, feeling a bit more like a parent, but then maybe feeling more separate when they weren't part of a decision-making process or the schedule was very strict, so they couldn't act as independently as they would have liked to. Um, second, we had providing for and getting to know baby. They felt close to their baby when they were able to interact with the baby, um, provide care for the baby, and then they felt a bit more separate if the interaction sometimes appeared to to cause problems like a desaturation or something like this. Um, the, the next one is making parents feel like part of a team. And I bolded this one and a couple of the next ones because those were ones that I realized there was a very heavy healthcare provider impact. So the parents felt like they were becoming part of the team when we would involve them in the care uh, as they learned to trust us. But they also felt separate if they felt maybe unacknowledged, maybe the rounds passed too quickly, maybe we weren't able to ask for their um, input. Uh, acting as a supportive shadow, this was mostly nurse-based more than the rest of the medical team. So some parents would perceive our presence, uh, our ability to jump in as needed and kind of supervising like a safety net that actually made them feel more confident in caring for their baby. But some parents, uh, it made feel a bit more separate. So it reminds me that maybe I'm not the most appropriate person to care for my child. So this one's really interesting because you can see how the same situation might make different parents feel uh, very differently. Um, the next thing was leaving baby's side. Of course, you can guess that there was no closeness in this moment. It was always a feeling of separation. And then finally, the NICU environment. So parents learned to become comfortable within the environment. And as they were more comfortable, they felt closer to their baby. Uh, but some parents also described it as a very distracting artificial environment and that it uh, created feelings of separation for them. Um, so as you can see, it was actually very interesting to see how, as healthcare professionals, we're kind of part of this NICU environment. So when I started my career as a nurse in the NICU, I had this all um, in mind. So I was always a little bit on the lookout for the parent experience and how they were, uh, well, how they were experiencing their time within the NICU. And so it made me think, you know, how can I have an impact on these families? And having said earlier that I've always liked crafts, um, I thought maybe we can try to do some cute crafts for the families. Maybe it can um, kind of help them feel a little bit better uh, without throughout this experience. Um, and so why crafts? So first of all, to kind of normalize for them. So despite uh, a NICU admission, they do have a new family member and sometimes forget to celebrate the arrival because it can be very stressful, uh, whether the baby is born very premature or even as a late preterm or term uh, needing a bit of support. So with crafts, uh, these kind of create little items that parents can put into scrapbooks later or a memory box, memory book, uh, because a lot of families do this with any infant who is born with hospital bracelets, a hospital card, all of this. So a craft within the NICU can go into one of these kind of souvenir items. Um, crafts also help us to celebrate. So if you're a parent who's been in the NICU, you know that no milestone is too small to celebrate. And celebrating this small things actually help the day-to-day -day, um, be a little bit nicer, if you will. So it can help to acknowledge milestones, to celebrate holidays and different special occasions. Uh, one thing which I think is really important is that sometimes as healthcare providers, it's hard to really reassure families, but one thing we can always do is offer a little bit of hope. Um, and I do think that the crafts uh, help with that uh, to kind of change their perspective a bit. And the last point is that uh, the NICU where I work is the only pediatric unit in an adult care center. So we don't have child life resources. We don't have any of that type of support that a pediatric hospital would have. So it really comes down to the, the nurses and the staff in the NICU to kind of brighten up the, the environment if we want to. And I wanted to. So I decided to start making little super capes for our babies. Um, and I thought that they were a really special way to kind of show the parents how we think of their babies. And I've had parents tell me, actually, I thought my baby was so small and vulnerable and weak. Uh, but seeing that a healthcare worker who's taking care of my baby saw that they were 
thought that they were a superhero, thought that they were actually quite strong, really helped me shift how I thought about my baby. And I thought, you know, maybe my baby is strong and uh, maybe he can get through this and fight. So it was, uh, I got the idea at a conference. Uh, there was a picture of a baby like dressed as Superman. And I first thought, oh, wow, okay, this is very cute. And then I thought, oh, actually, you know, this is true. They are tiny superheroes. I hadn't thought about it that way before. And then my last thought was, huh, I could probably make this. Um, and so I decided to start in October. The conference was in August and I thought about it for a long time before actually jumping in. And oops, sorry. The reason I really started was uh, for Ellie. Ellie was the first micro preemie that I took care of uh, when I was in my orientation. So it was the first micro preemie I ever saw. It was the first micro preemie I ever handled. Um, and if there are any healthcare workers watching, you know the first tiny baby you take care of is actually pretty scary because you want to make sure that everything you do uh, is correct and is okay for the baby and won't cause any problems. Um, so when she was about to go home, I thought, okay, I really do want to make these capes, but if I make them, she needs to have one absolutely. So that's why in October um, I started. And so this is Ellie with her little super cape um, in October 2016. These are some of the first capes that I made. Um, and I've all, I usually use the first uh, name initial, the first letter of the baby's first name. However, we do have cases, uh, we're in a Jewish hospital, so we have some families who don't uh, give a name until the baby goes home later. And so in those cases, I've put sometimes like a little question mark with a heart, or I've asked them to pick an initial that's meaningful to them. Um, and I'll put that initial instead. Um, okay, so within the NICU, as you can see in the picture on the left, I usually hang the capes at the bedside. Um, if the parents are there, I'll usually give it to them and explain to them that it's kind of a little encouragement, um, that their baby does need our help, but they're doing actually a lot of work themselves as well. Um, and they stay at the bedside throughout the NICU stay. And then we have a family that you'll see on the next slide who started the this tradition of taking a picture of the baby at discharge with their little super cape uh, flying out of the hospital. So in the middle, we have Chloe and Lily, little twins who went home just around this time last year. And then we have Romy on the uh, right with me flying away at her discharge. Um, a lot of families use the capes to celebrate milestones. So this is another little Miss Romy. Um, the picture on the left is actually framed on our unit now. So when we walk in, everybody gets a chance to see it. Uh, when they came back to visit in the hospital 17 months later, they took a picture in the same window of her with her cape. So you can see there's a lot of growth 17 months later. And they also used uh, her little super cape for a photo shoot for her second birthday. So they've continued to incorporate uh, the little cape to celebrate all of her milestones, which I think is very special. Um, a lot of families have sent me pictures of stuff they've done with the capes later. So you have on the left here a family who used the superhero theme to celebrate their baby's 100 days, uh, which I thought was fun. We have here a little photo shoot a family did in the middle. And then on the right, a family who really wanted to go just straight to their cottage as soon as they left the NICU. And so they brought their little super cape with them. And this is their little Albert uh, exploring the forests of Quebec. And finally, here we have Mr. Ben and his parents who made themselves their own super capes for Halloween, uh, for his first Halloween. And uh, a little guy here called Ezra who likes to play with his super cape and continue to be a little superhero. So uh, to date, I just counted yesterday, I've given out more than 1600 capes, which is a big number. And when you think that it, uh, it represents 1600 families who've come through the NICU who we've been able to have a little impact and give encouragement to. It's actually very special. Um, and just a couple little fun facts, statistics. I've kept a book with all of the first names of the babies I've given capes to. And the letter A as the first initial is by far the most popular with about 15% of babies with the letter A. Um, and then the second is M and L, which are both tied at 9%. And that's almost more than a quarter of babies with the initials A or M or L. So it's a bit fun to take a look at that. Um, 
the next thing we started, and this was more recent, it was in the last two years or so, we always thought, you know, it would be so great and cute and fun to do footprints and footprints, you know, taking footprints, it's something that families often do with a newborn at home uh, when they haven't come through the NICU. But if our families waited to do that, they, they wouldn't get to see how much growth um, the, uh, their baby has actually, or how much their baby has grown. Um, and so in the last two years or so, uh, my colleague Valerie said, okay, let's do something about this. So she spoke to our doctors. We found a paint that the doctor said, no problem, you can use this to do some footprints. And we got right uh, to work. So we create little footprint keepsakes. Um, so as you can see, the top one here uh, will take usually two footprints, but this baby had a central line or maybe it was a PIV. And so we couldn't take the left foot, um, but we take the footprint, put it on a really cute paper and parents can take it home to frame if they want or really to do whatever they would like. I've had some families come back uh, the next day or a few days later and say, oh, look, Stephanie, we've already framed it and put it in the baby's room. So it's uh, very special for them. We'll make also sometimes bookmarks or birthday cards for siblings, for family members. We have very uh, limited visiting hours and only grandparents can visit. So often it's a bit hard for the siblings to uh, kind of feel close to their new baby so I've made little bookmarks and I have one here just like this so just whoop, a little laminated footprint and sometimes we'll write a little message on the back or something like this uh, some families have said oh this is so great I'm going to use it to write the card and ask uh, the godparents to become the godparents for their baby and then what I've also done with some of the micro preemies is try to take repeated footprints, so about a month apart, and it really helps to visualize the baby's growth for the families. Because when you see your baby every day, you don't see the growth as well as someone who might see the baby more periodically, or if you look at the footprints from one month to the next month, it makes a very big uh, difference. So I have just a couple of examples of little footprints that we took. And if, uh, when they're multiples, I'll try to take, uh, I'll make like the keepsakes like this, but I'll try to take one of each twin, for example, and put them back together. Or in this case, it was triplets that we put back together uh, on this little paper. And then finally, this is a new model that we just did yesterday, actually. Uh, so now that the parents know that I like to make these crafts because they received them, I had a father come to me and say, oh, I have my dad who's in town for only 10 days from quite far abroad, and I would love if we could make something for him to keep of my baby. And so the dad found uh, a butterfly idea online, and we made this last night, and the grandpa was so, so, so happy. It was very cute. Um, and so the other thing, like I said earlier, since um, since we are a um, pediatric unit in an adult care center, there's no one to come in and decorate for us. So we, we decorate ourselves. Um, and there's a little group of us who really do like to decorate. And so we try to celebrate all of the holidays as much as possible. And we have had feedback from families that it makes it a bit more fun to them. It makes them kind of smile or laugh to see what we're up to and to see how much fun we have while we're doing it. Um, and so we try to really celebrate as many holidays as we can. And so you'll see in the next slides a bit of our decorations, a little bit of our footprints that we've done for different holidays. Um, so for Valentine's Day uh, this year, we did these cute little hearts and we decorated the entrance to our NICU with them. And then of course, after the families could take them home. And we also have this little wall where you see the owl with the hearts. We have a very long hallway. Um, and, and so we usually try to put something on this wall to make it look a little bit nicer. And in this case, uh, for Valentine's Day, we put up this little owl and we had all the baby's names written on the hearts. Um, and the families actually really like to walk by and find their baby's name within uh, the wall. Uh, so this is the entrance to our NICU. Of course, it looks very hospital-y, but with the hearts, you can see that it looks maybe a little bit cuter and a little bit nicer to arrive and to see this as you're walking in. Um, at Easter, again, this is our wall. We have these little eggs. This was another year we did the little chicks. Um, this was an office door that we decorated with the Easter bunnies' feet. We haven't done footprints yet for Easter, 
but I have a couple of ideas for next year. So we'll see, uh, we'll see what happens. Oh, this was Mother's Day this year. Um, we did little footprints, put them on a really nice paper and wrote from the bottom of my heart to the tips of my toes, I love you, mom. Uh, these were very, very well received by all of the moms. And what's kind of fun um, is I like to try to include the parents when we're doing the footprints like this, making something special. So I'll have them choose the color they would like. Uh, if only one of the parents is at the bedside, if it's the dad, I'll say, oh, we're preparing something special for Mother's Day. So like, sh keep it a secret. And they're usually pretty happy to, uh, to get involved with my crafting ideas. Uh, this was just a picture of a lot of the Mother's Day cards that we made. And then for Father's Day, we made these little rockets. So I actually have one here. This was the first one that we tried just to see if our idea would work. And obviously, I hope obviously for you as well, we thought, oh, wow, this is perfect. And so we wrote, uh, I love you to the moon and back. Happy Father's Day. So this is a little array of all of our little rocket ships. Um, and I had a dad tell me recently that as soon as we gave it to him the next day, he had already put it up as, at work. And he loves to look at it when he's at work. Um, so this is the wall I showed you before. So another Easter one and two summertime ones. Uh, when the shapes are very different or when it's a lot of different colors, I'll usually try to include the parents again as well, having them pick a color or as you'll see later for the Halloween ones, choosing a shape that they want. Um, and then the families can take these home, put them in their scrapbooks, put them in their memory box uh, as little souvenirs. Uh, Halloween was the first time that I decided to draw on the feet and see if I could make little, little shapes. So you'll see between these ones and the Christmas ones, I think there's a great improvement. So I look forward to next Halloween uh, to try to make some more ghosts. I also had some little Frankenstein, some little witches, and another small ghost. Um, we decorated the entrance of the NICU with these. The parents were very amused. And this is another one of our wall of fame with a bunch of different shapes for Halloween. Uh, Christmas time, we have a, a Christmas tree that we put up on the unit and we make ornaments with all of the baby's names on them. Uh, so the families can take those home afterwards. Uh, and we also invite the families to, well, and the staff to create ornaments to decorate the tree if they'd like. And th these were the Christmas footprints um, that I had a lot of fun making. Uh, the first ones that I made, I had one mom who was also very crafty and very enthusiastic. I told her, okay, let's make like 10 different footprints and we're gonna try to draw on them and see what happens. And uh, we agreed that they were all quite good. Uh, so we made little Christmas trees where you can see the toes are the gifts, uh, some snowmen, some penguins. Uh, we decorated the door to the NICU again. There's also some reindeer you can see in the distance there, another type of uh, penguin and then the Grinch, which is one of the first trial ones that I did that I ended up keeping because I wasn't sure the cuteness factor was there. I couldn't quite read what emotion I had made on his face, but uh, I kind of like him. He's pretty funny. Um, and I have also a couple of things from my colleagues. So uh, a lot of people have gotten involved to do different things that become also quite meaningful for the families. And so some of my colleagues pre-make name cards for us. So when we have a new admission, we can just go to a little bag and go through all of these cute name cards and pick one um, for their babies. And then I also have another colleague, Bianca, who created this beautiful uh, chalkboard for us for NICU graduates. And so when a baby is graduating, we can put their name, the number of days in the NICU, the age at birth, their birth weight, and the discharge weight, and the families use this to take a little picture of the baby uh, with all of their information. Um, so that wraps up the more individualized uh, things that we do for the parents on a more kind of broad scale. So rather than impacting the individual families directly, but rather to have an impact on more families, um, we have a work group uh, composed of nurses and doctors who uh, work on projects to uh, improve the parent experience. Um, and we also work with our follow-up clinic to establish priorities that will impact uh, them as well. And EPIC stands for Evidence-Based Practice for Improving Quality. It's a network of Canadian, Canadian NICU, sorry, uh, researchers, clinicians, healthcare workers, um, who come together to share different projects they're doing, different statistics, uh, so that we can improve care together. 
And so our work group has worked on a couple of different projects so far. So I'm just going to share them quickly. Uh, we created new pamphlets for the NICU and our follow-up clinic. Um, I would be very embarrassed to show you what we gave parents before, but you can see this is very cute, colorful, it looks good. And we have them uh, French and English on both sides because we have a, a lot of French population here as well. And then this is the NICU follow-up clinic pamphlet that we just got last week. And I have to tell you, I was very excited to open the box and see them. Um, we also uh, started a readathon, um, and this was to uh, give us an opportunity to discuss the importance of reading and early literacy with the families in the NICU. Because um, one of the things that we see in our follow-up clinic is that there is a certain amount of language delay, and so within the NICU, we already have the potential to impact that. And so we have these readathons twice a year, and I think we've had four so far. Uh, we give a book to each family and the parents keep track of their reading. Um, and so you'll see on the next slide, this on the left is our wall of fame again, but, but revamped for the readathon. And so all of the little books and music notes, um, parents have written their baby's name and the date when they read a book with the baby. So you can see we had a great success uh, for this one. We're also part of an initiative with early words. Um, so early words, really helps to promote early literacy for families and they work with our follow-up clinic. So we give books to the families at each of their follow-up visits up to five years old. And we have these posters on our unit, uh, Words Grow Their World. And you can see here on the right, it's uh, the basket at one of the bedsides. So you can see this family reads a lot to their baby. So they got the message. Uh, and then we're currently working on an early literacy in service for nurses. So like I said, um, we really want to promote reading as much as possible. And we want to ensure that all of our uh, staff understand why we're doing it, why it's important. Uh, so that, that that message gets through to the families. And we're also currently working on a website um, for the NICU parents. So finally, um, crafts, I think, bring some fun, some distress distracting to a very stressful um, environment. They bring a bit of a sense of normalcy, a bit of a sense of being a parent to your new baby. Uh, they're also not as time consuming as you think. So I would suggest trying it out if you've been thinking about it. It creates really happy memories for families, especially um, having something to take home to share with the siblings or even helping to uh, make the craft while you're there. And it also has inspired families to make their own crafts and to decorate their baby's environment. So I have a couple of little pictures on the next slide of some of what families have done. So on the left here, um, a family congratulating their baby for their first month and for reaching 1000 grams. Uh, in the middle here, we have Romy and her mom and they had created a little Christmas tree of pictures uh, I believe it was one picture per day. So what was really neat was uh, seeing her progression day to day. And then on the right, this was William and his family. They really, really celebrated the milestone. So each of the little animals you see on the left part of the picture um, was a different milestone that was important to the family. And they would have the nurse fill it out and sign it uh, as a little memory for them, which was special. And then their family members also created this photo collage of everybody who was cheering him on. So it's kind of fun for us as the healthcare workers um, to come to the bedsides and see that the families are celebrating and are kind of making it a special experience. Um, and so I believe that's it. So thank you so much for listening. Um, and Fabiana. Uh, wow, Stephanie, thank you so much for your presentation. And I hope people watching us whether from a hospital at home, get some inspiration from you. Uh, I love every single piece, and I think I would be the biggest collector <laughs> of your items and my day was and then I see you. I wasn't in your and I see you, but I, also, I have a little box of uh, keepsakes that it is truly special for us. And sometimes when you are in the NICU, you don't appreciate as much as when you come home and you look, wow, like, and you look at the nurses, okay, this is what they did for us, and it's so special. And I actually loved when I came to the bedside and I saw a new sign in my son's incubator. Like this is his new, uh, rocket ship when they had to change all the dressing inside the, the incubator. 
and photos. It's so special. I, I think on behalf of all the families, I can thank you for taking this beautiful initiative and put so much effort and consideration to the family's experiences. So beautiful. Okay, I have a few questions for you. Uh, mm -hmm. I think more from the healthcare provider point of view, how did you manage to do all that with the, your infectious disease department in your hospital? Mm -hmm. Do you have support from other nurses and management? Um, so I have very much support actually from uh, management and from my colleagues. Uh, I usually have to interrupt their cares a little bit to do the footprints, for example, um, and they happily let me do that. Um, and my head nurse, Chloe, is very, very, very encouraging and of the crafts and of the decorations and all of this. Um, for the infection prevention, so it's a really good question because so we have just these little, it's eight little jars of paint. And when we first got them, we we're like, oh no, we cannot like share this baby to baby, of course. And so what we do is we take little medicine cups and just take the tiniest amount of paint because we don't need a lot of paint. When you put too much paint, mm -hmm. it makes very ugly footprints and it slips and slides just everywhere. And so it's just, I put it into a medicine cup and then I use that and throw it out afterwards. So I'm not sharing the paint like into incubators or anything like this. Whatever has gone into the incubator goes right into the garbage um, afterwards. And we just clean the foot with water afterwards and it comes right, right off. So it's very, very quick. I don't know. If you have a lot of beautiful comments that I will I'm um, sharing here, but you can go back after on Facebook and, and read them. But I want to share from Diane. Amazing working, Stephanie, and the hospital, uh, the Jewish hospital. We have all your our keepsakes and feel very grateful mm -hmm. for all that you so one of your patients, okay. which is very nice <laughs> to see uh, people coming back and appreciate everything that you do. So my next question is, uh, you mentioned a little bit about where you get ideas. At first, the cake mm -hmm. was from a conference. How about all the other beautiful ideas that you have? And on top of that, who finance uh, the materials for you? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so the ideas, we'll usually think, okay, it's Mother's Day. Let's do something cute. What kind of cute Mother's Day saying or wish can we find for the moms because we knew we would be doing footprints and so that's why from the tips of my toes or from the bottom of my heart to the tips of my toes i love you mom we thought that was cute since we had all the tips of the toes in the picture um father's day when we found the rocket idea we thought i love you to the moon and back you know it's something that we say and we were able to find something like equivalent in french and even in spanish because we have a lot of spanish families now um, so usually we use internet a little bit to help us. Uh, and like if you Google footprint crafts and stuff like this, you'll find different ideas. Um, and then for the, the the holiday crafts that I started drawing on, I just thought, you know, we could do something even more seasonal, more themed for these different holidays, something kind of funny and silly. Uh, and your other question was, this costs money and what do we do about it? <laughs> yes, because uh, we're not the well, hospital would pay unless it comes from the foundation or a small initiative from parents. So how do you do? Yeah. yeah. So in our case, it's really the nurses who really like to make the crafts and decorate who take it upon ourselves to go out and purchase the items. Um, for the capes, I've received a couple of times actually little gift cards from families who wanted to make sure that I could continue to make them and um, wanted to kind of pass it or pass it forward, pay it forward. Uh, so that's always very nice. But when I think about it, I think that the positive impact that these things have really, really outweighed the financial cost of them because it's not, I guess, not that much. Wow, you're incredible. So I have a question here from Pat. Let me bring to the screen. Great work. How do you manage celebrating special mm -hmm. occasions such as Christmas or even Father's Day, which are not appropriate for everyone? Great yeah. question, uh, because this is obviously we have multicultural cities with people mm -hmm. from many different backgrounds, from the different cultures. So how do you, do you ask the families uh, which it's holidays a, they celebrate and you try to cater to different uh, cultures and religion? It's a fair question. Um, I would say that we tend to celebrate the holidays that 
are widely celebrated in Montreal and Quebec. Um, the one holiday that's a bit trickier is actually Halloween. Surprisingly, some families really are not into Halloween at all. They have very negative associations to it. So that's why, for example, when I was saying I'll go around and ask the families if they want their if what if they want to shape, what shape do they want? I've had some families just say, no, don't, don't, no, I don't do Halloween. Don't do that. Um, and I think to a certain extent, they also understand that this is kind of for everybody that we're trying to do it. We're not trying to offend anyone. Um, and I've not had any negative feedback from any family for any of the holidays that we celebrate. Um, at Christmas time, we put up a Christmas tree. We have a menorah and a couple of more Hanukkah related items. Um, and even the Jewish families will tell them, you know, we're making ornaments uh, for the babies on our Christmas tree. Would you like your baby to have one? And we've had some who were very amused at the idea that their baby had a Christmas ornament and they thought it was fun. Um, for Father's Day, um, you're right, it's not appropriate for everyone. There may be families who don't have a dad. Um, in that case, I just made another craft for the mom and wrote, I love you to the moon and back mom. You know, they're, they still deserve to have the craft, but we just didn't make it fathery at all. Okay, and the other question you mentioned in your presentation about the language, you said you have a lot of uh, Spanish speakers, you also obviously in Montreal have a lot of French speakers. Mm -hmm. Is there any other language that sometimes a family requests or they help you translate so they can have a craft in their own mm -hmm. language that is more meaningful to them? Yeah, so definitely um, I will ask families for help if I know that they speak a different language, if I should make it in a different language. Um, like the little butterfly that I showed a little bit earlier, uh, this is a family who speaks Spanish and the grandfather was unilingual Spanish. So I told the dad, like, come on, come on, I need your help. Please write down what you would like me to write for him. And then I was able to just write it for the grandpa to make it meaningful to him in his own language. So I do include them that way as well, if I can. Oh, that is wonderful. There's a comment in French that we will let you read because I don't speak French, so I can't really read. Uh, but I guess it's a lot of compliments to your work and your your team in that I see you. Yes. Uh, merci, Paul. Very good. You had lots of comments there for you, Stephanie. You can go back <laughs> and read after. Um, so another question that I have for you is like, when the parents come to the NICU in the first few weeks, it's so overwhelming. And for many parents, the birth so early is not real celebration. Because I remember a lot of parents said there's nothing to be, why are you congratulating me for, for, yeah. you know, the birth of my child at 23 weeks and so hard to see your baby that way. Uh, do you approach the parents and talk to them about keeping uh, some memories of the NICU because this is was the last thing in my mind when I came to the NICU to keep yeah. those, to remember those things or, or as you mentioned how the progression of the size of the footprints because we mm -hmm. don't really know. I have my son's footprint this big when he was first the first week and mm -hmm. when I look now is that you know it's a little piece it's of my deep. finger like you yeah. don't have any idea but also don't think about it because mm -hmm. of that overwhelming moment. So do yeah. you talk to parents about this and how important it is that every day in our baby's life is really a milestone because they made mm -hmm. one more day? Um, well, we actually do have a couple of different things. We do try to talk to them in a way, like you said, they're not like happy to be there. They don't want to be there. They don't want their baby to be born already. But we kind of have to acknowledge that like your baby is born, your baby is here and your baby is alive and it's something to celebrate. Um, often we'll keep a little biohazard bag of little, like the first hat and the umbilical clamp and stuff like this, just in the drawer of the isolate to give to them later or to give to them right away if they want it already. Um, Cause you're right, some families are like, no, don't really need to take any of that right now. Um, we also have um, something that's really nice. It was an initiative from a mom at St. Justin Hospital, I believe, which is another big pediatric uh, hospital in Montreal, that she created a book uh, for families who are in the NICU to write down every day. So it has like little prompts, like today the baby weighs this, is feeding this, this is what happened during the medical rounds today, uh, how am I feeling today, what are my questions for the medical team, so I think that's another way for families to kind of create memories because like, I think 
and this is my perspective of it as a healthcare worker, but I think while you're in it, it feels like it's never going to end and you just want to get far away from it as fast as possible. But then afterwards, when you think back on it, what I'm told is that it, it's like a, a flash. You can't believe how long you spent there. You can't really remember all of the details necessarily. You look back on the pictures and can't believe your baby was ever small like that or vulnerable like that. And so it, we do often suggest to families to write things down um, to, uh, to help them look back later and also kind of to look back and process their experience in a way. Um, and we have, a, I don't have a picture of this, but we have a family who created a book that, uh, that they called it something like uh, Thomas's Journey. And so they have pictures almost from every day from all of the different milestones. And you could see within a whole book his journey from, he was maybe 24 weeks, 25 weeks to discharge home. And now he's over one years old. So last time they came, they brought us extra pictures to add to the end of the book to show where he was now. Um, so it's another special way for families to look at. And I know there's a couple of families who are working on their book now. <laughs> that is wonderful. And also I think it's a way for the babies to understand their own journeys, right? Because one day they're going to look back and say, okay, this is how I came into the world. This is what I went through. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a pro I think and now my son is 11. And when I show him the size of his, uh, the blood uh, pressure cuff is so mm -hmm. tiny in his arm. He's yeah. like, wow, I was that tiny. I say, yes, you were that tiny. So it's, yeah. In a way, it's a celebration, right? And to see how far they have come as individuals yeah. and tell well, their stories, because we do a lot of awareness around preterm birth. And my son does a lot of uh, announcement that is poor on word prematurity day. So really to help yeah. the community to understand the, you know, the yeah. celebration plans that preterm babies have and many yeah. throughout life. So another question I have for you is when baby gets very, very sick and mm -hmm. the baby's going to pass away. So do you work with families on creating memories of the baby or if you talk to them, okay, when the baby passed away, you can do this or that um, so they can keep the last mm -hmm. memories of the, I mean, the last days of yeah. the baby. So definitely, it's obviously a less happy uh, mm -hmm. time, but we still want to make sure they have something special to keep of their baby so usually so whether they are there or not there and some families don't want to take this right away some want to take it right away we'll create a special memory box uh, that has like, the baby's name card the baby's hospital card some id bracelets we'll take hand hand prints and footprints um we'll usually take a little lock of the baby's hair uh i'll usually put their little super cape in the box for them. It happened once or twice that the baby didn't have a chance to get their cape yet because I was not there for a couple of days or so. I've even put some in the mail with a little note uh, to the family, sending them my condolences, but also letting them know, you know, your baby has had an impact on people and not just on you. So when they're there, we like to involve them. Um, we had a family who lost a twin back in April and they had some older kids so the older kids were able to come and we involved the kids in creating the footprints and creating the handprints so that they could each have their own copy as well and I have to say that one was a lot harder to process emotionally on our side but it was also very special I think for the family yeah because it is these are the things that families we always remember right mm -hmm. like was special when i lost a, a twin I, I the nurse gave me a bracelet gave him the footprints gave mm -hmm. me the, the hand prints and the time i was so overwhelmed i didn't even think about anything mm -hmm. but today when i look back i cherish those those memories and i have on a, on our family wall i have the footprints because that's pretty mm -hmm. much all i have um, and it's so precious to us, but it's also precious to my surviving twin and my older son to yeah. always remember that they had a brother and it's part mm -hmm. of the wall through, and the only thing we have is the footprint. Yeah. So it is very, very special for us. And I think those, what you're providing families is so invaluable that is beyond what you can possibly imagine, right? You've been doing this for less than a decade. And I'm very curious to see the families coming back when those babies are teenagers. Mm -hmm. and come to you and telling their own stories and 
show their, their own appreciation to you because this is really special as a family. It's kind of, you know, it's a, something it's, that it stays with us. Yeah, something tangible for something that's yeah, been very exactly. Yeah. So Isabel, I'm going to share your website here. If you can just let people know about your website, if they mm -hmm. want to be in touch with you, learn more from you. Um, you thought you said you were involved in uh, in the epic and the quality improvement projects. So it'd be very nice if other healthcare providers are watching us and mm -hmm. wants to follow your steps. How to uh, go about doing that? Um, so this website uh, was created for our NICU by one of our doctors, Dr. Narayan. So you can kind of keep track of all of the different projects that are happening in our NICU. And this is where our parent website should show up eventually hopefully soon in the next year, but we're working on it right now. <laughs> oh, that is wonderful. Stephanie, thank you so much for joining us here today from sharing your experience, your amazing talents to create these beautiful uh, memories for families. And I'm looking forward to having you again in the near future. Thank you so much, Fabiana. And to all of you watching us live today, thank you so much for joining uh, today's episode of the Premi Chats. And a special thanks to our sponsor, AstraZeneca, who make education sessions like this one possible. And just a reminder that if you miss part of today's session, head over to canadianpremies.org. I'm going to share our website right here. Oh, OK, here you go. Uh, where you can see this episode and all past episodes of our Premi Chats. You also find many resources and support options available there. And you also be reminded that CPBF is a charitable organization and depends on support to continue its important work. Please consider how you can support CPBF and its mission to empower families of premature babies in every step of their journey. Together, we can create a brighter future for all babies and their families. And we'll see you again next Friday, 1 p.m. Eastern Time. Stay well.